Grab your Bibles. Uh, Pastor Mike's going to send some more outlines around if you need some of those. And uh, we're going to continue in the 11th chapter of Corinthians. We got started two weeks ago prior to our vacation Bible school and uh, did so much historical background we didn't get very far in the outline. But we're going to try to move forward today, inch along. Next week we'll try to have on your tables two sign-up sheets one will be for the senior adult uh, game night that will be coming up in a couple of weeks. And the other is the East Texas Baptist University hymn sing. If you want to head over there, it's in the middle of the afternoon. We'll get all that information on your tables. I believe it's the third week uh, in September. I've got that packet on my desk. So we'll start signing up in the next couple of weeks. I'm trying to get the illustrious Joshua Thomas to uh, take our group over there. The only problem with that is the last time I trusted him to drive the bus, he got it stuck under a carport. So, uh, do you think we could trust him to drive? I don't. I'll probably drive and let him just ride along. Now, for whoever's going to email me for that, Be, be aware that we love Josh, don't we? Let's pick up uh, in uh, verse number 23 and read through the end of the chapter. I'll make just a few quick statements about what we talked about two weeks ago, and then we'll move on with our outline. For I have received from the Lord what is also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until... He comes. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. NIV does a, well, six of the main line of 18 translations do a great job when they use that word manner. More on that in just a moment. In an unworthy manner, <coughs> we'll be guilty of sinning against the Lord and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without it, discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink uh, uh, judgment on themselves. Remind me, we'll be back to that word judgment. Verse 30, that is why many among you are weak, sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. If we counted correctly there, Three classifications, weakly or weak, sick or sickly, and those that have expired, those that have fallen asleep. If you were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined or chastened so that we will not be finally condemned. With the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it will not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. Well, uh, on your outlines, we just gathered around three words. We've only really looked at the first big word. Yeah, there's some subtopics here too, but three big words. And that first word that we started with last week was a word of desecration, or two weeks ago, a word of desecration. It becomes apparent when you look in verses 16, 17, and then where we're really looking, our focus is more on verses 18 through 22 uh, in this last section, that uh, Paul gives this scathing indictment. And we talked at length about that almost the entire time two weeks ago. So we won't go back and reflect on that again other than to say 
the language here, and here were the little fill-ins under that. We use the word divisions. Wow. We use the word factions. And we use the understanding that they, uh, they had no comprehension. Those were the three little fill-ins that we kind of walked through. And again, I, I don't know how, how, how much to review or don't, but for a few that weren't here, uh, the picture that we tried to give was this. The word divisions, schisms, schisms, uh, scissors, to, to rip, to tear. That's the language that's used there, uh, that people were coming together uh, mid to late first century church in the Corinth area, gathering around the Lord's table, uh, which had become a agapeo, a agape love feast, so to speak. We know there was a period of time, uh, more of the history from last week, that people were meeting together every day of the week. They were dining together every single day. There was a period off and on of about 11 years in there that we think this was going on pretty commonly in first century life. Uh, it, it kind of kind of settled a little bit in the later first century. People kind of returned more to, to a norm of once a week type of worship. But those uh, meals and homes continued late into the first century and really early in the second century. And, and, but, but with that, even in those gatherings, it became very apparent those that had good food and had means and wealth, they would set a time for the meal. They would get their first they would eat the prime food, and then when the others that had a lesser socioeconomic position, a lesser racial position, remember we're talking about slaves that are gathering. We're talking about those out of the Greek culture. Now they are not Jewish descent. You had a menagerie. I mean, just a, a total conglomeration of people that were thrown together. Do, do, do you remember that, that tri-prong that I kind of introduced you to or, or reminded you of in many cases that were merging together from two weeks ago, we said there was what? There was the Jewish influence that had hung on for hundreds of years. There was the Roman Greco influence, the nation of Rome, the world of Rome, this Grecian influence. And then there was this new movement underway in the middle of all that called the church. And so when you put these three things, elements, together, it became quite, um, <laughs> quite fun to watch as these uh, elements unfolded. So those were the, the, the words around the desecration. Paul, Paul was pretty frustrated. And, and, and the biggest thing I think that we can take away from verses 17, uh, 16, 17, 18, all the way down through verse 22, is how disappointed Paul was and how people were treating one another. Did you, would you just let that soak in for just a moment? <laughs> That's why our fellowship, you hear pastors talk about this often, the unity of the church, our fellowship is so very important. We can disagree on a lot of things. We like this music better than this. We like this kind of small groups rather than that. We like this material rather than that. We like this menu rather than that. We like to ride on Pastor Mike's bus because he doesn't rip the top of the bus off like Josh does rather than Josh's bus. It says here on my notes, really pick on Josh today. Gotcha. So we, we, we have a picture of that, don't we? Now let's look at this second big word. I don't know how you'd make anything out of this. A couple weeks ago I've written so many sets of notes on here I can't read any of them. But uh, I will uh, do, do, do my best. Verse 23, a word of explanation. Now this is probably the cleanest section. And if we just took the Baptist faith and message that pretty much outlines this section for us, uh, from in terms of our theological roots. So I'm not going to introduce anything that's phenomenally new to you, but man, it just does us good to kind of go back and look at this. Again, in verse 23, Paul, I think, does something very important. He says, now, as I'm opening up my heart and writing about this, 
I want you to be reminded of something. I want you to be reminded that these are not my words, but look in verse 23, but what? All I'm doing is passing on the words from the, from the Lord. Do you see it in verse 23? I receive from the Lord what now, what I'm passing on to you. It's, it's as if he's just saying, hey, now, maybe that's a good place to do that after you've spanked everybody about their divisions. He used that word heresy early on. He used that word, uh, the concept of division. And now he's just saying, just want to remind you that the Lord is, is, is sharing some things with us here. So three things uh, that any time you and I take the Lord's Supper, you, you just need to know this. This, this, is, this should not be something that you should ever be without. You shouldn't have to have your Bible with you. You should just know this innately. There's not very many things in Scripture that I would tell you that, hey, th- uh, I, I guess what I want you to understand is this. Wh- when we talk about communion, there are three elements of communion that you and I just cannot separate ourselves from. But, I mean, that's just who we are, period. You go into someone's home. Many of you, if after spending several days with you or weeks with you, I, I would kind of start to, to learn where the heartbeat of your home is. Uh, lo- a lot of people say that's the kitchen. <laughs> that's a table. That's a particular place. This is kind of, Pastor, as you can kind of see, the center point of our home. Sometimes that's a shop. Sometimes that, for a single lady, is a sewing room. But you start to get a sense of kind of the makeup. And the makeup of evangelical life, when it comes to our relationship with the Lord in communion, I mean, I don't know how you can... Paul just lays it out here for us and reminds us, and, and, and let's just jot them down. The first one is, is what we will call recollection. I mean, we cannot take the Lord's Supper without a revisiting, a remembering, a reconnecting with, a recollection with the Lord's faithfulness through his willingness to come to what? Offer himself as a substitutionary what? Sacrifice and to die for us. And that is a historical fact in our lives. That's something we have to look backward to recall and to reclaim. And man, that's the heartbeat of the Lord's Supper. And, and, and that's what Paul starts with in there in verses 23 and 24 and 25 as he's just reminding it's 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 the heartbeat he said to jesus on that night he's taking us back isn't he do you see it in 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 verse 23 and on the night not just some night but on what the night and that just brings up a well for us or it should if if that doesn't mean anything for me to say as you come in, you see a candle burning, and you see the elements, and I say, hey, we're going we're gonna to go back to the night. No one should think about prom night. <laughs> I mean, no one in here should think about, well, I guess he's referring to when we got married 62 years ago. No, that's not the night I'm talking about. We all kind of join and weld our hearts together, don't we? We... we we go back to those, well, three and a half. <laughs> John, rather a little sketchy. You have to go a little earlier in John, but at least the other three gospel writers give us pretty good detail there, and certainly Paul adheres to some of those details. So we'll understand what the upper room was. I mean, man, that was a key. I mean, that was, I mean, that was a night, wasn't it? It was Passover. Jesus' final triumphant entry. He had come in on that little donkey and Hosanna, Hosanna, we got it, and it's the last time. Oh, he's coming back, but he won't be coming down any dirt road on a donkey. <laughs> He'll be riding something else when he comes back. And uh, it just, I mean, I mean, we think about it. The betrayer in tow. 
Judas still not found out. Oh, well, the Lord knew him. <laughs> but the other guys just thought he was just one of the gang. I mean, arguments about to set in. I mean, you remember the night. Wow. Hey, we got a special room picked out, guys. Go down there and tell him. And just mention my name, the party of Jesus. <laughs> He'll know what to do. The rain's just been made. You guys go on ahead of us here. Let's get everything set up. It's Passover week. It's a special time. We understand, don't we? We start getting into that mode, that feeling, that genre. And it's about recollection. I mean, if I were to say his body, his brow, his hands, his feet, his side, if I were to use a, a crown of thorn, I mean, I mean, think about it. I mean, any asundry of terms would trigger us to what? We remember that. That's our Lord. And, 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 and it disturbs me. And I hope it disturbs you that when I come into a communion service, whether it be on that side of the street or this side of the street or in a nursing home, how many people seem to be aloof and disconnected? You know the heartbeat because... I've made half the people in Longview mad when I say this, but I am on a vengeance to get the Lord's Supper out of routine in our lives. I hate routine. Routine almost stole at Oakland Heights Baptist Church the routine and ritual of it, almost my own fault, not blaming the church. It just happened here. But it wasn't just here. If I was with Dale Hall down there, my buddy in Harlan at First Baptist, I, the ritual would have stolen it there as well. In the 70s and 80s and 90s, the ritual, I think, stole. This is not a ritual. This is not something we do routine. This is something that reconnects us. It's a recollection. And we walk through it again. Verse 24, he gave thanks there's the body. This is my body, and Paul's just taking us back. As you take this bread, boy, I, I just jotted down here, John 6. You know, we could wander off there today, John 6, 51, 52, 53, right in that stretch, where Jesus talking about, you know, it, <laughs> this, is a, this is a great theological principle. Our Lord is the bread of life, isn't he? And so, man, I mean, this takes us back into our roots when we, went, we spent three years in John, when Jesus was trying to teach them about, hey, I'm the bread of life. And so what Jesus is, is driving home here, man, there's that connection with the bread. I'm the bread of life. You know, how do we separate and, and, and help people understand this was such a huge moment in history just prior to the cross but you do understand Jesus is also trying to lay the groundwork, isn't he? He's, he's trying to lay a foundation here of, of, of taking people back from, well, uh, originally of what? Hundreds of years of the Passover being representative of what? Some blood over a doorpost. And he's trying to usher into what? Us into a whole new covenant. I mean, this is, a, this is a historical handoff here. This upper room is forecasting what's about to happen on the cross. And so you have that element that's going on. Remember the three little prongs that we just kind of <laughs> talked about again? You know, that Jewish history. Remember, this is all they knew. This was Christmas time, if you will, to them. This was the most sacred of holidays. When the patriarch took the cup, with the first of four cups, and when he laid down that cup, and what, an understanding of what? That, hey, we're about to talk about something that's important historically. I see that some of you get distracted easily. See, see, see for me, the roof could fall down, there could be 60 abducted children, a tornado could be on the way, and you know what? I could give, I could care less. I'm just so in tune with God's word and what's going on. 
I don't care if, phone, if, if phones honk, if people leave, if people hackle, cough, if, 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 if they nettle me and mock me. I, hey, baby, I'm zoned in on the word. And so these other things are not going to buzz around me like a hummingbird nest and distract me. Right here. So we have this recollection. Two times in the King James is this worded. Paul makes sure that we're reminded this is for you. Jesus said, hey, this is for you. This bread, for you. This cup, for you. You know, over here in the margin, I've got to be honest with you about this. I jotted this down in the truck coming over. I made this a little note. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 16 through 18 that we just dealt with, all this division. Do, do you think that as Paul's taking this group back to the Lord's Supper, communion, Do you think it's a coincidence that this and division are side by side? Do, do, do you think that the envelope, as it kind of folds down and touches one another with the beginning of the Lord's Supper and all the, the, the foolishness that's going on in Corinth, do you think the fact that those things are touching have anything to do with each other? I just made a notation here about the Lord's Supper, as Paul lays it down here, should be something that is a conflict dissolver. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Communion should be a conflict dissolver, but that's not what it was in Corinth, was it? Oh, no, no, no. The rich people were getting the best food, huh? And getting it before the others. And some were not getting anything. Paul says, I'll tell you what, you ought to take all your food, but you eat first. So you don't even need to eat. And you just push all of that good food up there for others. That ought to be your heartbeat. I just made a notation here. When we love Jesus the way that we ought to, we will love his people the way we ought to. If you and I are so absorbed with the Lord Jesus Christ and just recollecting what he did for us and reviewing it, hey, when we are so absorbed with loving on him and we are so intense in our love and admiration and gratitude for him, then in the essence that is going to displace so much of the foolishness that goes on in the world around us. Recollection. Jot this down. Proclamation. When we take communion, Paul's just letting us know again that, hey, this is going to be announcing something. This Lord's Supper is going to be declaring something. Man, we could go on and on. The Lord's Supper is going to be asserting something. By the way, look at it uh, here in verse 26 in the very first part of that verse. Whenever you eat this bread or this cup, you... Now, the NIV uses this word, doesn't it? The NIV chooses the word proclaim as the world. The world, re I mean, the, the world really is to herald. The word there, when you go back in the, in the Greek roots here, it's, it's the essence of... Uh, announcing something or putting something before us, literally to herald, to, to, to show. King James maybe uses the word show. A couple of revised standards show, word proclaim. Hey, the Lord's Supper, if nothing else, it certainly makes some assertion when people walk into a room and says, ha, ah, they're going to have the Lord's Supper. I mean, it is communicating something, isn't it? 
And so Paul's reminding us that part of this explanation he's trying to give to the church at Corinth and he tries to give us is, is when it comes to our communion, as he's explaining it, there should be a reconnection here, a recollection, if you will, of all of that covenant transfer from an animal uh, to the actual blood of the Lord Jesus, the transfer of, hey, up until that time, all of history, everything was on a what? A substitutionary blood offering of some sort from past animals. And now all of a sudden, this is going to be sealed with a one time forever substitutionary death with God himself that's come in the flesh. I mean, that reconnection and that recollection also suggests something broader that as we take it, there's going to be a proclamation about the whole act of remembering that. Some of the greatest and sweetest people that I've known that have come to Christ have come to Christ in the midst, are you ready for this, of a Lord's Supper service. It, in the most uncanny way, can soften hearts. You may tell you in New Mexico, there's two groups of, uh, well, s- s- some of you are familiar with Calvary Chapel work. Calvary Chapel, well-known group here, especially in the States. Calvary Chapel churches in many different uh, cities in, in the U.S. Uh, Skip there, Skip Hotzik and other pastors have done such a great job uh, in New Mexico, just the state in general, of helping people out of what has been a real caste system of Catholicism, where many of them have not been to any kind of mass or organized worship in 25 years, but they say they're Catholic, and trying to lovingly help them come to know Christ. The other thing that has been remarkable there is the work of Southern Baptist life. It has been quite remarkable. And uh, we had that opportunity at First Baptist Albuquerque uh, at least, I think, 23 different times that we're aware of. We were able to see someone come to know the Lord Jesus Christ out of one of our communion services. Because as you know, Catholics are steeped in ritual. And the Lord's Supper has every kind of opportunity to be ritualistic. And so when you get into liturgy and ritual, that lights their fire. And man, when you start having communion and you start talking about transubstantiation and the verb tenses there and and the impact of that, man, we just had some great moments especially in a couple weeks following up to our Lord's Supper service because that service literally proclaims something to a world, not just of those that are saved and partaking, but of those that are watching and witnessing. That really says something deeper, doesn't it? It reminds us as believers, the world is watching us. Can I hear an amen to that? They're watching us. Recollection proclamation. And then, gosh, I'm trying to remember how the Baptist faith and message, what what word they choose to use here, but expectation. You and I cannot take the Lord's Supper without some element of expectation that's before us. Look down in verse 26. Whenever we eat this, will you proclaim, we said in the first part, but look at that end of verse 26. We proclaim the Lord's death until he what? Until he comes. Isn't it great? That whether we like it or not, whether the pastor or whoever is leading the communion services mentions it or not, there is an eschatological, a second coming element of Christ that we cannot separate from communion. Just like in that upper room, Jesus was trying to give a forecast. Bread, body, cup, blood. It was a forecast of what's about to come. And he says, hey, you and I are going to do this now, but you and I are not going to do this again until, well, quite honestly, they didn't get it, but a long, a long time from now, quotes, unquote, for you, it'll be like in your mind and heart, if you could figure this out, it'll be a long time. But he says, there'll be another kingdom, and you and I will not get to do this together like this in a physical sense until that time comes. And so all of a sudden, we're looking forward to something, aren't we? See, that's why, man, when we have communion, I don't see how you and I can ever separate from these elements. 
I mean, it's, it's just a part of who, I mean, just the, the genre of it. Hey, we're, this is going to take us back. <laughs> I mean, you can't separate from that. And, and then the statement that this thing made, man, it, it's, it's a proclaiming statement. But also, when, as we come to the end of that, we've taken the elements, and we get ready to close this element of communion at that moment, we understand it's far from over. Our Lord is going to be returning. That's why we talked about last week five times in this chapter. It keeps saying, when you get together, when you get together, when you get together. See, the last exclamation on any communion is, hey, this was very meaningful, but can you imagine how meaningful it's going to be when we all get together again? <laughs> Boop, boom, with a big exclamation. Those that we have departed from this life that can't take it physically with us anymore. We're going to be back together. Boom. And the Lord Jesus, it won't be the spirit that will be indwelling in us. It'll be our Lord Jesus that his physical presence will be with us again. And so there's incredible eschatological implications to this. This is a big exclamation point. And so I think we got that. And I know some of you are going to walk away today and say, man, if there's anybody in Southern Baptist life that's a nut about communion, it's Michael Cook. And you know what? I'm okay with that. If that's the indictment, heap it on. Because I do not think that we can minimize communion. And I don't think you believe that either. And if it really were being transparent today, I think some of you would go with me today and say, Pastor, there have been large stints of time in my life that it became kind of a ritual thing. I went through the motions too, but I'm just too doggone embarrassed to admit it in front of 100 people today. And so if you join me in kindred soul and you're transparent and honest, thank you. But you and I have an obligation to teach those that are coming behind us. And they're watching you. Some of you won't be here this Christmas for our Christmas Eve service. You'll be in Oregon, or you'll be in Wisconsin, or you'll be in Florida, or you'll be sitting with grandkids at somebody's communion service somewhere. And let me tell you something, Papa and Mamma, they're watching you. They're watching how you partake. But more importantly, they're watching your life. We lost something out of that three-pronged forge there of Roman Greco Jewish new church start when the patriarch of the Jewish family that took the first of four glasses during the Passover, when he took time to teach the history to all of those children at that Passover table, there wasn't any playing around and there wasn't any voluntary, <laughs> I don't want to go. <laughs> Every Jewish child was inundated year after year after year and properly educated in their roots and their theology and mom and dad made sure they learned. And so now we have a generation that is far beyond the ones that did not learn we have generations piled up on, caked up on, stuck one on top of another, and that's why we have such a deep-rooted, rebellious culture. And so I guess as we move on, I just reach out to say, look, sometimes, let's be honest, just out of respect for old people, People will listen to you just out of respect, even though they don't want to. They'll do it because they don't want to disappoint you. And what I'm telling you, some of you grandmothers and some of you grandfathers are going to have to get in that little, those little sections when you have the ear and say, hey, what does communion mean to you? Let me tell you what it means to your papa. It, it's a reconnection with me. It takes me back. You remember like a photo, a family picture? 
and, and you, there they are in your lap, or there they are at the bottom of the Christmas tree just watching, or, or there they are in church on the way home from a Christmas Eve service, and there's an opportunity for you to say, man, this is, it, it, it takes us back. It takes us back. Well, last word, a word of explanation, and a word of preparation. And maybe this is the hardest section for us to kind of walk through, uh, a word of preparation. Go, go to verse 27. This last section has a lot of interesting little didos for us. A word of preparation. Verse 27, so then whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup in an unworthy manner, and I mentioned a moment ago, that's significant, will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, I've kind of put three little things here. They're not synchronized. They're not alliterated. They just kind of keep us on track because they all flow together. Obviously, that first one here I want you to jot down is the, the concept of unworthy. Now, there are so many different translations here, okay? Some of you just have the word unworthy. If you partake in a, unworthy, uh, if you are unworthy, period. Uh, others have an I-L-Y, unworthily, if you partake. Others have a translation, as the NIV does, it says, in an unworthy manner. And so, I mean, obviously when you have this huge, broad span, the Greek is a little bit challenge, challenging for us, and that's why you see the translators kind of diverted into a number of different patterns trying to make sense of it and to try to communicate it the best that they could, uh, crossing it over into the English language. Uh, it's, it's as, as Paul kind of moves away from the communion table and, and, we, and we kind of walk away from it now, he says, uh, when you get ready, it's, I, I personally believe that I think Paul kind of almost had this as an afterthought. It's like, uh, now that I kind of talked about that and I backed off from it, it's, it's, it's like, here may be some good advice for you. Before you ever go in and partake, you need to get yourself ready and the first part of that getting ready is do not ever come to the table in a, in a state of unworthiness. Now let's talk about this concept for just a moment. Certainly we could take the word unworthy and like so many did during the Reformation and in that part of world history, many people would not even take communion for about four, five, six hundred years in world history lore because they took this statement and said, hey, who of us is worthy? Who here is worthy to take communion? <laughs> I mean, if Luke was honest, was he really even worthy to be at the table with God himself in the flesh, a perfect, sinless man? Are you kidding me? No. Well, I don't need to ask you about old Pete, do I? Oh, Peter, <laughs> was he worthy? Boy, it didn't take you long to say no. What about Judas? Was he, was he worthy? Oh, man, we start starling. Though. And you, you do understand, don't you, that that's not what Paul is suggesting here, that, hey, we need this to come to the place we, we, we can't, I mean, we're just unworthy. I loved at a world history, one of those Scottish priests, I don't remember who it was, but recorded back in some of those early writings, took a tray of elements uh, during one of the communion services to a parishioner, if you will, a congregant, if you will. It was a single lady, held the tray there, as history tells us, and, and, and she shook her head as if she was not going to take the elements from this particular minister in which he whispered to her, none of us are worthy. Please partake. Do you think maybe that's the proper focus here? None of us are worthy, but please partake. So when it's literally rendered there, do you see it in the text in the NIV, an unworthy manner? That is right on target. That's not saying, speaking to our perfection or, our, or any kind of hope of a sinless nature. What, what it's speaking to is what? 
the very makeup of our hearts, the state of our minds, the place that we're in spiritually, emotionally, as we approach this, he says, hey, you need to kind of start getting focused. One of the things that I just grew up in, as many of you were in the athletic environment, is uh, game days were special days. Fridays in Texas are special days. And it's still that way. Been that way a long time, and it's probably going to keep being that way a long time. Because Friday night, Friday night light, some of you saw that Gary Gaines, the great coach at Odessa Perman, just died here in the last 48 hours of complications related to Alzheimer's, of all things. But um, game day is different. I mean, uh, horseplay, <laughs> let's see, how, how do we say it in East Texas? There ain't going to be no horseplay. <laughs> I mean, school that day, a little different. Pep rally schedule. The whole, whole schedule's different. And then is that, as those lights got ready to come on and 10,000 people filled the stands and those buses pulled up and you started hearing those, whistle, those whistles of the officials as they're out jogging around, you know, the hated men in pinstripes. And you saw the other team and all of a sudden two communities are about to face off. And I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it, it was like a different kind of focus. And so for me, that's just a real easy thing for me to understand because I grew up in that kind of environment. Hey, our worship is always a special time, but when you see those plates and you see that cover, hey, it, it's game day. I start recollecting. There's a statement about to be made. There's going to be a reconnection made here. And we walk out of here, there's going to be something with great hope because, hey, we're going to have this meal again, and it, it, it's not going to be in a broken, marred world. There's going to be a day that it's going to be a great communion. And so that's, that's the essence here. Verse 27, this preparation. We start with the word, and I hope you jot it down, just the word unworthy. We just kind of toss it around to kind of help you. Now, here, here's my question. Here's your question. We've got to hurry. How do we make sure we're worthy? What does that mean? And Paul takes us here and gives us a couple little things that help us. Now, jump down. Don't worry. We're coming back. But jump down to verse 29 for just a moment. I'm going to swing you back to verse 28. But go down to verse 29. For those who eat and drink without discerning, do you see this? The body of Christ, they eat and drink judgment on themselves. Now, one of the things that Paul tells us is that we ought to what? We ought to examine how do we make sure that we are worthy by what? By, by starting off by what? Examining ourselves. There's your little fill in here as we just keep kind of walking along. We, we've got to be examining ourselves to make sure that we're what? Rightly related. We're, 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 we're in the right frame of mind. NIV uses discerning. What a great word. Discern about yourself and see if there's anything that would keep us from being where we need to be. Now, what has been the whole focus of these, of, of, I mean, the whole overriding arching of this is not just examining ourselves, but here's a little second thing. Examining ourselves in terms of what? Our relationship to one another and to what? To the Lord. There's the examination. Part one. How are you doing with one another? Well, not well. Well, what's going on? Well, our choir is at war. Half the choir is upset with the director. and It's Christmas time and the music guy just gave, I mean, it's pick on Josh Day. And the music guy just gave solos to these two ladies and these two ladies are mad. And so in my world, Pastor, having communion right now is not a good thing to do because I can hardly even, I can feel the tension up there among those chairs in the choir loft. And Wednesday nights, Pastor, it's so sad. Everybody just sits there and nobody's talking. And it's like of all things. Now, right in the middle of that, somebody has, who did this? They scheduled communion. 
Hey, you think that's ever happened in Baptist life at some point? Yes, sir. Pastor, who would have scheduled communion when we're remodeling the sanctuary and you know there's been a war going on about the green, blue, or red color components in here? And look, all the greenies are sitting back here in that corner. And the people that wanted to put a similar red to what we had in here, and that's how it was built in 1957, and that's where I'll be now, they're over here. And those other three birds, we won't even mention them. They're up here in the front. You get the picture. The haves, the have-nots. Paul's taking his back, isn't he? But also that we're discerned that we're what? We're right with, come on, stay with me. We're right with the Lord. How are we in terms of our vertical relationship, not our horizontal with those next to us, but how are we vertically with the Lord today? How are things going here? Now lasso back with me to 28, and it says, and to, and to do this, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the, of, of the bread or drink from the cup. There it is. It's how do you do this? What are we checking on? Horizontal, vertical, vertical relationships, our relationship to the Lord. We're, we're, in a, we're in a worthy manner. And, and he says, hey, that's done by a checkup. If you have heart problems today, I dare say you probably go to your cardiologist pretty often and say, hey, how's the old ticker doing? I've been toting these glycerin tablets around, you say. You told me if I ever stops, take it. Or if I ever start having pain, take it. And then jumping in the ambulance as quick as I can. Do I need to keep doing that? How are things going? I mean, a smart man, a smart woman says, hey, every three months, every six months, I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to get a checkup. I'm going to see how things are going. How am I? Man, if nothing else, communion ought to be a great time for you to say, wow, <coughs> we're going to have our spiritual oil checked. Because that's the time that you come in quietly and sit down and say, all right, Lord, <laughs> how are things going in my heart? And you're going to hear something back like this. You know the answer to that. But thanks for including me. Lord, I haven't had a devotional with you in six months now, have I? No. But I'm still here waiting. And so you just start to reflect on your relationship with the Lord, your relationship with others. Quickly, and then we've got to go to lunch. Verse 29, verse 32, be careful here. Paul is not saying, and the Greek language, just click on your, any of your Greek text here, I mean, any of your Greek tools, and you'll, you'll see this easily. Uh, but over in verse 29, in fact, I think the NIV uses the word twice here, but over in verse 29, do you see the word judgment right at the end of the verse? You see that? Cremo, crema, depending plural, singular. The word there means to chastise, to spank. It doesn't mean slight discipline. It means to really discipline. It's like, hey, you're getting in big trouble here. But you do understand, don't you, that Paul's not saying, hey, and, and, I, and I've heard pastors say this before, and boy, bad interpretation, bad translation here. Uh, man, I, I, I hope I haven't done that or, or will not ever do that. It's just, this is, this, to me, this would be a big no-no when a pastor says, if you take this unworthily, you're going to die. Well, that's not the language that's used here. But let me show you something. Go over just at, at no cost to you. Go over to verse 32. And do you see uh, at the end of verse 32 a word of C? I'm trying to think, the NIV uses condemned. Do you see that word condemnation or someone's condemned? That word there is kata, K-A-T-A, krima, krimo, depending on, again, the uh, plural or masculinity and all those things. Uh, he, here it means absolutely death, condemnation. But earlier when Paul's talking about, hey, you shouldn't do this and here's what happens, he's He's not saying, if you were to take that cup and you're mad at your best friend, psh, you're going to turn into an ice man right on the spot. 
What he's saying is, you're opening up for God's what? His chastisement, his spanking. In fact, he leads us into that thought, doesn't he? Look in verse 30. He says, in fact, a lot of you are weak, sick, asleep. Hey, I'm not going to finish this. I better stop. There's so much here I want to tell you about healing, and we'll do that next week because some of you are watching the clock, and I understand that. I need to respect your time, all right? So we'll, we'll come back. We've got, an, we've got 46 minutes next week, so we'll use some of that time next week. Didn't quite finish, but there's still at least 15 good minutes left, all right? Let's pray. We'll send you on to lunch. Hope you have a great day. And um, I just want to say again, thank you. I'm, I'm in the midst of my thank you notes for, for Senior Adult VBS. And man, have I already got a stack of them. And uh, I'm just taking time, not just to write a quick thank you note. I'm just trying to try, try to share my heart in each one of those notes because I talked to Glenn Owens yesterday. He got home safely. You know, uh, somebody joked about a thousand mile trip. Anyway, he, he said, I looked at my odometer when I get back. When I got back, he says it was a 2,004 miles. So it was almost 1,000 over and 1,000 back. But uh, he, he was just so complimentary uh, of you. And I just want to tell you again, so many of you, number one, participated. And so many of you, those kind of events don't happen without tremendous help and support. They're too big. And so when you, man or woman, those areas and nurture them and love them like you did, then some great things happen. And, but let me tell you the biggest takeaway. <sighs> my greatest, my greatest excitement about Oakland Heights Baptist Church is the harsh, critic, and cynic undertow is quieter and quieter. And the, aff the affirmation, the affirming praise and thankfulness and humility and other focus is getting louder and louder and more apparent. And when those kind of things happen, they impact all of church life. When people come to the point where it finally starts to sink in, this is not about me. <laughs> this ministry is not about me. This church is not about me. This is the work of the Lord, and I'm just here to try to help facilitate it, and I'm thankful to be on the journey. When you start having enough people that that starts resonating at the heartbeat of their heart. Other people in the community, you, you can't put that on a website. But as soon as they experience it, they start saying, usually it's these words, I don't know what's different. I don't know how to describe it. But something's different about those people in that church, and I want to be a part of it. And so I just want to thank you for the affirming way from, boy, especially legacy and Bible school, gosh, overwhelmingly positive. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time that we've been able to spend in your word. You are a truly a great God. And fathers, we kind of just back up for a moment here as we're just walking to really a, approaching a huge scripture break. We are about in chapter 12, to launch into uh, has to be in the top three, four, five controversial uh, elements of church life for the last 1,500, 1,600 years. Father, we, we, we have this window on, on, on the pre side of that uh, where, where we can just stop for a few moments and think about the Lord's Supper, walk through with some real clear language here, what Paul's intent was. And I, I just thank you that he was so meticulous in, in the way that he wrote and the way that this was preserved for us. So we, we have clear understanding how we approach communion, how we approach the Lord's Supper, and how we handle our hearts, how we handle the self-examination 
uh, what are the standards with others and before the Lord. And uh, Father, as we continue to walk through this, there's more that you have to say to, say to us about healing, about uh, those moments that you take people from physical life to physical death because they are an impediment in the body of Christ. There are some big resounding things here in these last few verses that we're going to be able to see about you and your nature and your work that are important for us to see and understand more fully. So as we gather back next week, rain or shine, we will gather again around these verses and we'll have a very similar prayer. Would you next week as well convey to us through your word exactly what you want to communicate to us and that it would be presented, it would be received and taken with a sense of accuracy and fulfillment for your purpose of your word in our hearts and our lives. Father, we thank you for those that have prepared lunch today. Thank you that we have something to eat. And Father, as we go about our activities today, we know there are those that are sick around us. We know there are those that are recovering from surgery around us. We know there are bat those battling serious disease around us. They are in a battle. So, Father, there's so much for us to pray about physically. But, Father, we also, there's so much to pray for about politically. Man, our nation needs a new direction. We need great leadership. We need a return to you and to your principles and to your foundation. And it seemingly is a tidal wave that we don't think we can get there at times. It's demoralizing. It's discouraging. But, Father, this is not the only time in history this has happened. We have seen historically this happen time and time again. Would it be practical for us to go back and look in those segments of time in our Bible that you might speak into our hearts and lives about what you did with the faithful remnant the remnant of those that were faithful. Father, that's what we're praying for today is that we would be faithful, faithful and firm. Then, Father, finally, there's so much to pray about today in terms of our churches. Not everyone here is affiliated with the same church, but, Father, we certainly are under the authority of the same God and the same Savior. So, Father, I pray for not just our church, this church, but I pray for all of our churches. They are all one under your kingdom and your umbrella. So, Father, as we go today, we go with love, we go with humility, and most of all, we go in peace. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great, great lunch.